just to show up.
How about now? Okay. All right. I I think uh, I think we're gonna skip. And uh, it looks like they're here now. So I'll do a couple of announcements and, and get us going here. So I'm Don Haas. I'm the Director of Teacher Programming at the Paleontological Research Institution and your host for Science in the Virtual and Actual Pub. Um, and uh, um, we meet every second and fourth uh, Thursday of the month uh, at 7 p.m. Um, most of those are probably virtual, but uh, we are uh, doing some of them live from various venues. Tonight we're in the pavilion at the Cayuga Nature Center. And, um, um, and let me uh, tell you what's coming up. So tonight we have do, do, do. Karen uh, Pender St. Clair um, talking about uh, the Comstocks of Cornell. Two weeks from tonight, we'll have Wendy Bowen talking about shaking up earthquake science. Uh, on December 8th, we'll have David Schiffman talking about sharks. And we'll have, fill in the holes in the uh, schedule um, for the fall shortly. And I am going to hand it off to Karen. And get her slides up and her slides are up and you can just take it away Karen. And just talk into the just ether. talk into the ether talk to the computer. talk into the ether oh hello ether <laughs> 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 hello everybody thank you so much for coming to hear my little talk about anna and um, this is going to be a little bit different of a talk um in my previous talks i've uh, just focused almost primarily on my on the book, my book right here, or the book I edited, this is Anna Comstock's book, and this is, was my dissertation work. But I'm going to touch on it only a little bit today, um, but I will take questions on it afterwards if you want. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is, so, you know, Anna Comstock, there are some people who are just absolutely in love with her. They are, I have had many people come up to me and they're just in reverent to this lady with, you know, and, and decidedly so. So I was kind of wondering, and I was asking this to myself and I thought maybe others might be interested. What was it about Anna Comstock that really influenced our interest and promoted us or pushed us into nature? So that's what I thought I would talk about today. And it was kind of, I was thinking there was an old symbol called Kilroy was here. So I started thinking about, you know, Mrs. Comstock was here. You know, she stomped around this land here in Ithaca and um, was really a prominent nature study educator here with and with her husband together, they were known as the Comstocks of Cornell at the turn of the 20th century. Um, they were really pillars of the, of the university. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, before, just to, now let me figure this out. And let me see, is this the one? Yep, that's the one. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, but before we talk about Anna, I'm going to talk about the Anderson School of Natural History. And it's like, Karen, what are you talking about? What does this have to do with Anna Comstock? This has a lot to do with Anna Comstock and nature study education, um, uh, especially on the East Coast of the country at this time in the mid 19th and later 19th century, early 20th century. This right here, I wanted to give you a little background about the Anderson School of Natural History. Uh, because this was really um, part of the, the foundation that Comstock and her peers used these techniques when they taught nature study. So here featured in this, in this photograph um, is uh, Louis Sagazis. 
And Louis Agassiz was a pro professor of natural history at Harvard. And he was a guest lecturer at, um, here at Cornell and taught 12 lectures. Oh, that's fine. Yep. <laughs> Trying to Hold fix on. the uh, slide issue. I know folks are having at home. I'm not quite sure why it's being so difficult. Do it that way, there we go. <laughs> okay, that's fine. And, and then I'll just, just, just go, go back. back. Okay, no worries. All right. So anyway, so he taught, so Agassiz taught 12 lectures of general zoology at Cornell. And, and as I said, he came from Harvard and he was known for Harvard um, primarily for his theories on the ice age and for never accepting the theory of natural selection. Uh, he was Swiss born. He was a biologist, physician, a geologist, teacher, and he was most importantly, I would say, um, the uh, what is this? There we go. He was known for his um, landmark. Sorry, I'm just having a little thing here with the computer. Um, work in, in glacier activity and in uh, extinct uh, zoology. So he had an idea to establish a seaside laboratory at, um, it's called, Pen I always want to say Pekinese, it's not, it's Pen Penikes Island. And this was off of the coast of Massachusetts. And what he wanted to do, let me see here, Okay, we're mm. um, about this. There we go. So Penikes Island here, I, I just wanted to show to the folks who are sitting here. Penikes Island is right off of the coast of Massachusetts. If you're at home, just look where Dartmouth is up at about your 10 o'clock position and then go straight down and there's Penikes Island. So this, this is where, right here, where uh, Agassiz, held his class and he was donated the land by a private philanthropist known, uh, his name was John Anderson, who not only gave Agassiz this island, but he also gave him $50,000 as an endowment to kind of permanently establish the uh, practical school of nature study. This went, this was, it lasted for a summer. It went on to a second summer, but in between that time, Agassiz died and after the second summer, there was a fire that destroyed the buildings. And so basically after two years, a, this wildly successful program for its time, it, it ended. Yeah, it was a shame. So here is, I was lucky enough to find some images from a newspaper in 1873 that showed there was about the first summer, there was 44 people. There were teachers that came from the normal schools, that came from um, convents, and they were graduate students who wanted to be teachers. And so they came, they answered the call, like, hey, I'm having this school, please come. They had 44 people the first summer, and 16 of those were women. So up here in the upper left corner, you'll see there is showing an illustration of the women's dorm room. Uh, following it around clockwise is an overall pic uh, illustration of the school. And then at the bottom is the uh, mess hall. This picture here is interesting because there were, the, go, the island was so isolated that there were sheep that were um, some, I don't know how the sheep got to the island, but the sheep had been there for so long, they were wild. And they would shoot these sheep and that's what they used, part of the food that they used to use to feed the students in this school. Now, what made this school so unique and what Agassiz was embracing was nature study through careful observation. And so here I love, particularly love this picture here of this, um, this would be on the lower left of the gentleman. Um, they are dissecting a fish. What they were doing that, that Agassiz had them do was get, they each had their own fish. And for six weeks, they had to detail every aspect of that fish from its scales to its guts and draw it and label and, and just take notes and they just very, very careful observation of this fish. I mean, now just as if you just stop and think of a, of a fish and you're gonna be looking at, you know, 
in six weeks, he, they said that it, it really started to smell around there by the end. I mean, it, it's staggering. And here in this picture here on the far right is the women, the, the young women, what they were making their illustrations and they were doing their, um, the dissections. And here is a kind of an overview photo um, that shows the lecture hall here with the Gazis on the left and then the laboratories over on the right. They, fo they focus primarily on fish and crustaceans and And in this, in this slide, let me, I just wanted to show you, this is a photograph of what the school actually looked like and a photograph of the island itself. So here we are. Now we have arrived. We've come forward a, a couple of decades. That took place in 1873. Now here we are at Cornell and Ithaca. And now I want to and begin talking about the Comstocks of Cornell. I wanted to give you that little bit of history about Anderson Isle, the Anderson School, because their tutelage of observation of nature was, as I said, was very key to what Com Mrs. Comstock wanted for her students and for what she wrote in Nature Study Education. So who were the Comstocks of Cornell? The Comstocks were both very prominent in their field. Uh, she was born in 1854 and came to uh, Cornell at about 1874, left and then came back again. And uh, after, and I'm trying not to go down a gopher hole because I know so much stuff <laughs> that it's like, we're, we're going to be talking about I did my figs. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's a whole other, that's a whole other thing too. How exciting. Um, yes. And, and Professor Comstock, he was born 1849. He was six years older than Mrs. Comstock. And um, we'll just, uh, this is what I want to talk about in the photos here. Just briefly, this is uh, from starting from the left, moving clockwise. This is Mrs. Comstock in her garden. Here's some photographs of them in their, in their probably in their middle age and they're in the prime of their careers. Uh, moving across the top, that's them sitting on their laurel bench. Farther over to the right is Com first Comstock Hall, and, and this is 1915. It exchanged hands several times. So if you're looking at it and you're like, no, Karen, wait a minute. I know that as being XYZ building as well. It's, yes, you're probably right. It just was, they would just shift around the buildings for its purposes. The picture below is Comstock Hall today with the entranceway. Here is, um, uh, just a picture of their books that they published. And then um, the center photo is actually of a newspaper clipping with Professor Comstock be as instructor. And in that photograph, Mrs. Comstock, who is right here, she is a uh, student. All right, Professor Comstock, he was primarily interested in science and he wanted to go to medical school. And when he first um, came to Cornell in 1870, he actually was very interested in entomology. And there, but there was no entomologist at Cornell at the time. And he basically, he, uh, he established the department. He began, he was the first, he was a, the first instructor in economic uh, entomology when he was a sophomore because in college, because they didn't have anyone. He was self-taught. And he was very good. He was a natural teacher. Um, what is showing here in these illustrations is part is a top view of part of the collection that uh, Professor Comstock and Mrs. Comstock took of different insects and of their uh, at different stages of, of their development. And these are the pins and papers that they used to secure the collection. There's, of course, that's Cornell Tower in the middle, and then there's Professor Comstock there on the right at the end, sitting at his desk, and the picture below is his desk that's in Mann Library at Cornell. Here is uh, their, the, they are sharing a workspace. Mrs. Well, Mrs. Comstock, she had her, she had a medium, her art medium was in pen and ink and pastels and watercolor and of course wood carving. Here are these little pictures that are here in the center on um, more towards the left. These are, um, this is watercolor. These are two pastels. These have never been seen in public before. This is the first time I'm showing them. They have not been seen in public before and um, unless you've been down to the archives. 
That was just some of her work that she did when she traveled overseas into Europe. There is um, this, the image on the far left with the uh, lunar moth. This was taken from the edit, the, the manuscript for the manual for insects. And she, she drew these illustrations and she also did the wood carvings. She learned wood carving, even though her, she was originally going to do watercolor paintings for her husband, but he had her learn uh, how to do wood carving. She was already artistic in an artistic vein. So he felt that she could pick it up easily and she did, and she loved it. Wood carving. The book is much cheaper than say the copper prints, and or and at the bottom photograph there on the bottom uh, right is an example of the copper plates and the prints that were made from copper plates. So she the wood was as I said was cheaper and um, and easier to work with. All right. This is just to show a little bit more of some of their work. The their insectary that he built on Cornell in eight, the summer of 1888 is in the bottom left. As you go upward toward um, clockwise, that's the a painting of the Comstocks. That was um, that painting now hangs in um, Comstock Hall. When you first walk into the building, it's on the left. The center is uh, from Comstock Knoll up at um, Cornell Botanic Gardens. The top um, right photograph is um, those are called dropped capitals or drop caps. They are used as a decorative element at the beginning of paragraphs. You've probably seen them in some older books, nice books. You'll see that first capital letter is very ornate. That's what she, she liked to work on. And so those are different uh, drop cap examples that she did from some of her different books and her different writings. Uh, yeah, we, we can have the lights on or not. I mean, I'm okay. <laughs> but um, the, the middle picture um, on the right is the chalet. That was the home of Comstock Publishing Company. Oh, hello, everybody. That was a uh, um, home of the, of the Comstock Publishing Company. And they had the saying above the, on the upper part here I'll just, on the chalet, there was a, a plaque that said, uh, through books to nature. Just to be warning you, we're turning the lights off. You're turning the lights off again so you can see the pictures better? Oh, that's fine. Okay, so they so they did, the, the Comstock Publishing Company was through books to nature and they started the company so that they could publish their book, The Manual of Insects that I, I showed you previously um, on this photograph with the Luna moth down at the bottom. This, was, this book was gigantic. This book was over um, 500 pages uh, and, and, it might, and more, and they could not find anybody who to print it. So they decided to do it themselves. And then they went on from there publishing all of their books and even books of their friends. Um, so that was really instrumental in, not only in, to, in their individual success as well. All right, the nature study department. The Anderson School of Natural History that I talked about at the beginning uh, had, a, as I said, had a significant impact on the nature study department at Cornell. And many of the department's members that you see here were influenced even directly by um, the, uh, the work that Agassiz had did, that they were influenced. Um, and they were mentored by the men of Agassiz's generation. Uh, these people just let me use okay my, my mind starts to fly let me just show, point out some of these people because i'm going to talk about them later this here at in the bottom center and i know the folks at home probably won't be able to see this i, I don't they're this here this is john walton spencer right here is john comstock here is liberty high bailey this is um alice mccluskey here's mrs comstock this is Mrs. Bailey in Prince Paris. And um, I guess that's about all I care to point out right now. This was part of, there were students in the background. These weren't all, you know, and that were part, but the core of the nature study was here. This, I believe, is Mary Rogers Miller. Quite a few women. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was really, it was, a, it was a very good field for women to work in. Um, so as I was starting to say that the many of the department's members, they were influenced and mentored by uh, men that went through Agassiz, 
uh, from Agassi's generation, there were two people in particular who were at that first class who are prominent to um, Cornell. Uh, one of them is uh, Jordan, uh, David Starr Jordan. He was in that first class and yeah. And so then it completely flies from my head, but um, they, oh, Burt Wilder, that's it. Burt Wilder, he was a professor at Cornell and he was John Comstock's personal mentor. And so Burt Wilder, because he was in that first class at Anderson, he of observation and observing nature. So, and of course, and um, Agassiz, he came from Harvard and part of the, the group at Harvard was Asa Gray. Asa Gray was a prominent botanist in Harvard and he was Liberty Hyde Bailey's mentor. So it was really a tight group. The biggest difference between these, there was almost, but there was still almost like two different camps. And the biggest difference between these was um, those who were strongly influenced by Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution and those who didn't believe it. And those who were more along of a philosophical vein. Uh, so um, Asa Gray and Liberty Hyde Bailey were more of a philosophical bend, whereas Burt Wilder and then John Comstock, they were more of a Darwinian scientific bend. And that will be important to kind of keep in mind also for later. All right. Here is showing is, um, is the book, the new, the new, um, the what I call the definitive autobiography of the Comstocks of Cornell. This replaces the 1953 edition and is a book that I edited um, to bring back Anna Comstock's voice completely from her manuscript. Um, what also, what I found um, in, uh, in researching this and rekeying, I rekeyed the entire surviving manuscript of her autobiography that she typed. And what I found were the, the prominence of these, four women at the bottom, Alice McCluskey, Ada Georgia, Mary Rogers Miller, and Julia Rogers, that they worked, they were had close connections with the Comstocks. They worked closely with them. And they worked closely with the three on the top, John Spencer, Anna Comstock, and Liberty Hyde Bailey. Alice McCluskey worked primarily with John Spencer and she wrote a majority. There is, I don't know if I can see it now. These are the, the Cornell I have here. We must take it for granted. The Cornell study leaflets. <laughs> These came in. Thank you very much. These came, the, the Cornell study, they, were, they, had the, they wrote them for teachers and then they wrote separate leaflets for children. And Alice McCluskey wrote over 30 of them, with the majority of them for the children. And what is that called? this is the Cornell nature study leaflets. Yeah. And um, Ada Georgia, she assisted uh, Anna, she was Anna Comstock's assistant and she wrote her a book of her own called Manual to Weeds. It's a very large book and um, it's, it's very well written. Uh, Mary of the Rogers sisters, Mary wrote the Brook, the Brook book and Julia, she wrote over 12 books. The most prominent being the Shell book. She moved to California in her later in her career and um, became known as an environmentalist, an activist out um, for the oceans and the earth is, or the, the ocean line there on the coast by California. Um, the, what did I want? There was something that I wanted to say in particular. Oh, one of the things that's really interesting about Anna Comstock is that and with these women, and even Professor Comstock, he was a big advocate of this as well. And it's what you mentioned um, about uh, the women. She, because Anna Comstock used her, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Like, well, wherewithal as a professor's wife to get what she wanted or what she needed to have done. And so she was able to use her influence to get these women to publish their own work their own research uh, on their own merits. It did. It, it was not on the heels of, of a husband or a father. It was of their own work. So that's so she was important in that way. Alice McC and she could she could they uh, as I would find found in the in my book I talk, I talk about she 
um, she could work a room. She could go, she could talk, go from talking to a farmer to talking to the president of Cornell. She could transition that easily. She was very social and very affable. And whereas Alice McCluskey, she was very down to earth and very much of the people. She was um, not as refined as Mrs. Comstock, but she is an equal to Mrs. Comstock because a lot of what Alice McCluskey did is part of the work that Anna Comstock pulled together for her handbook of nature study. Now this group as together as a nature study department, this is an example of the body of work that the Cornell nature for a 75 year period. And it is staggering. This top shelf here, the top photograph is a shelf of books all from the nature study department, the different, there are different books that they produce from different people at different times. This photograph here of the books and the pamphlets in the driveway airing out and drying um, as part of the leaflets that are here on this next photograph next to it. This is over a hundred years of information that is uh, that the, these people wrote, gathered and wrote. And it's-, so it's those education leaflets, the, um, the Burn Rat Castle, start writing those in the 50s? Say that again, please. Did Vern Ratcastle start writing? I will be talking about uh, Sir good. Sir Vern. Uh, yes. Yeah. Anyway, they, so as I said, this is the this is an example of overall of the amount of work that they produce. Just to break it down a little bit, here is um, sort of a, a a tree, if you will, of the evolution of the nature study department at Cornell, and it is arranged based on who was kind of in charge of the department at that time. Um, and I'm going to now, I'm going to take this photograph here and I'm going to break it up into sections and just sort of ex explain what is being reflected here in this, in this image. <clears throat> so the top, top of the book, there's a, this is the Cornell nature study leaflets. And there's another book here, the boys and girls nature study review, the rural leaflets and the handbook of nature study. This is all reflective of the work of Liberty Hyde Bailey and John Spencer, Martha Van Rensselaer. Um, that name might be familiar to Martha Van Rensselaer was known in um, the home economics. She was the founder of the home economics department at Cornell. Well, she was originally a school commissioner and was very passionate about teaching children um, about nature. And she wanted to work with John Spencer and he, she said, I am ready whenever you make the call. Um, so together, she, Rensselaer, John Spencer, and Anna Comstock, they wanted to produce uh, nature leaflets for children beyond New York State. So they, that's where they came up with boys and girls. Nature Study Review, and this is difficult to see, but this, right, the signature below Nature Study Review, this is Martha Van Rensselaer's copy of, of these books that I have here. And which is always, to me, is always kind of fun because I just feel like it's, you know, Martha was here. <laughs> and um, so, so that was one of the early projects that Anna Comstock worked with in nature study education and in draw, first bringing children in. She first, she, again, it's with the top book. She started with Liberty Hyde Bailey and she wrote leaflets primarily for the parents and teachers. They were going for the teachers because they wanted to educate. Like, this is how you do this. This is how you teach nature. And then they realized that, hey, you know what? The parents are interested in this too, and they can get the parents involved. So Anna and Liberty Hyde Bailey spoke mostly to the adults. Alice McCluskey and John Spencer spoke mostly towards the children. In this, um, as we continue the evolution, this now shows the, the later years of when Laura, E. Lawrence Palmer and Ava Gordon um, took over the helm after Mrs. Comstock passed. It was um, Palmer first and then Gordon. And they kept into the theme of observation like Liberty Hyde Bailey and Anna Comstock had promoted. However, the dialogue changed. It was rather than talking directly like with the children, like as if you're trying to engage them in conversation of like, what do you think this is? It was more of a direct, this is what it is. Period. It was. It was. It was not a back. Like, it, there wasn't like a back and forth dialogue in the writing. It was more just. It began just being told. This is. This is what it is. Period. Um, Vern Rockcastle. 
he took the um he took when burn rock castle took over and you can start to see when you look at these here it is when Palmer, this row appears like when the top row where it says electricity and Beatles is where uh, Palmer and Gordon, you can start to see it's not just Beatles and flowers and ancient sea life, but you've got here electricity, you've got measurements and you've got chemicals in action. That's different. That's really different than teaching the nature study from the pre earlier years. That is now taking a more scientific bent. When Vern Rockcastle took over and uh, uh, that scientific bend became even stronger. It was then just the facts. And um, it was still in trying to engage for a scientific direct lesson. It wasn't um, an opinion or an observation. You know, this child looks at a bird and sees these types of feathers and the child looks at the same bird and maybe sees a different formation with the beak. You know, there was none of that. It was, you know, this is the bird, this is what it does and see if you can find it. I mean, literally, uh, <laughs> it, you know. And then the book, and then Robert, uh, Richard Fisher, he came also into, um, uh, uh, he, he worked with um, Burn Rock Castle. He came after, it's basically like, uh, this is, if you, if you would think of it as like the top row is like, say the 40s and 50s, the middle row is like the 50s and 1960s, and then the bottom row is kind of like the 60s and then into the 70s. So the, the, all of them were kind of working together, but it's like they had, there was a hierarchy, you know, a few people had to move off or die and then the next person would, would go into place. So the bottom book, so uh, Richard Fisher was already working at the, um, you know, in the department, but he wasn't yet head of it until later on, whereas, and then, um, but it was just, it was all Vern Rockcastle for right now. And what Vern Rockcastle developed were these STEM science books. And as you can see, this is really quite different looking. When you look at the bottom book with the blue pages, that's quite a elementary, different looking sort of book than say here, where you can, even though you can't read the book up here onto the top left that's open, it's next to Know Your Trees, you can see there's a lot written. Those are questions. It's not just dialogue, but there's questions talking. One thing that I wanted to point out in this group is this right here. This is the top, on the top right, there's a white book with like a red sticker. And that book is actually how uh, knowing butterflies. And that is written by Anna Comstock. And so in 1955, Anna Comstock work was reprinted and used, whoops, and used again. <laughs> Just have some wind here, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, it wasn't an owl. <laughs> we do have an owl. Yeah, but we do have an owl. <laughs> so let's, so now let's talk, thank you very much. So let's talk, let's talk now about a little bit about the handbook of nature study. Um, this was actually John Spencer's pet idea. John Walton Spencer. This was, this was his idea to write this handbook of nature study. And, um, but he took, he took the proposal around to a couple of different publishers and they said, there's no need for this book. Nobody wants it. Nobody's interested in this. We're not going to print it. And so he kind of let that idea drop. And he also had an idea for the pet book. A, a book of, you know, about pets. And of course, both of those books, The Handbook of Nature Study and The Pet Book, Anna Comstock did write. Um, John, the, the Handbook of Nature Study, well, John Spencer retired in 1909 and was not really close at Cornell anymore. Um, he'd come periodically, but uh, he died then in 1912 in, um, here in Ithaca. And um, in 1911 was when the Handbook of Nature Study was printed. So he did get to see that realization, you know, come to fruition. Um, what I wanted, just kind of a little bit of interest, the, the young woman next to the picture of John Spencer is Clara Kiapka Trump. She was an assistant of Anna Comstock's and she learned how to sign Anna Comstock's signature because they had so many requests for the book and, and to have autographed copies. 
that she would sign the book. And she got so good at it that she said later in an interview when she was an older woman that she had two copies on her shelf. One of them she signed, one of them Anna Comstock signed, and she didn't know which one was which. So if you're, you know, so if you've got a copy of, you know, something that's signed by Anna Comstock, maybe not, you know, just, just putting it out there for any of you eBay, you know, prowlers. And um, yeah, so this is talking now, we've got handbook here. The handbook, what is great about the handbook of nature study is that Anna, that comes out, she talks to us. She talks to the child, she talks to the parent, the student, the teacher. There, this is not overly scientific language. It is not, um, it is a, really a nod to Agassi's work on Anderson Island. And Comstock's beautiful vocabulary. She, what she does that is different, that is different from even the early, um, the early literature in the Cornell study leaflets is that she presents um, like at the beginning here, the top in the top left, it's, we have a poem. And then she talks in very lyrical language about what, you know, her subject matter. And then she goes on and she will ask directly anywhere from, depending on which lesson you look at, anywhere from nine to 12 questions. And sometimes those questions are divided, you know, each divided into two or three questions of them, them own, their own. So it was, it was, it's very engaging. It's very um, hands-on. It's very much, you know, what do you think about this? Where, you know, go and take a look at this bird or this flower or this bug and watch it and see and look at all different points of it and see this is what it's doing right now but in the springtime it's going to do something different in the winter it'll do another thing that's different and so that you could learn about nature she opened up nature for uh, through all four seasons for everyone and made it interesting and she made it personal it wasn't say you know me telling you this is what a a bird is or a flower is this is you looking at that natural object outside your door and you discovering it for yourself. Now, I wanted to bring in, in this, I, this some, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some articles that I have written. This article in particular is about the nature study initiatives of Spencer and McCluskey and Georgia and the Rogers sisters. And what, I wanted to, um, to talk about was, um, oh, sorry, hold on. What I wanted to, to talk about with this is that this is kind of like where nature study has evolved to, to today. Today we have, um, as, as it says, and this is a quote from Anna, that it introduces, um, uh, the students it's the, to all different levels of, oh, actually, this is my quote, sorry, uh, 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 levels of botany and zoology and entomology and, it, and other living systems. And it allows you to become enthusiastic with nature at whatever level you're at, with whatever interests you. I remember as a kid watching ants carry a dead fly down into their hole for two hours while my parents played pinochle on the card table above of my aunt and grandmother, because that was so fascinating to me. It's like, what grabs you? And that's what Anna Comstock, and that's what all these people, they wanted with this early nature education. What grabs you just so that it'll get you out there and you can you know, discover it for yourself. Today, we see that in terms of um, school garden initiatives, botanical gardens, um, nature classrooms, just like the pavilion we're in now, outdoor nature classrooms. And even uh, this was a class, the pond at the bottom was a class that I assisted with in teaching them about pond life. Um, and then over there on the far right is the, um, the, the was known as the corpse plant commonly, but it's the Titus arum. When that comes into bloom, it, uh, it's usually, it's at uh, Liberty Hyde Bailey greenhouses there right in front of plant science. That's where they keep it. So if you ever get a chance, you hear that that thing's in bloom, go down there and take a look 
It's fabulous. And I'm standing in that photograph, I'm standing directly in front of the bud. That's how big it is. It, it's great. And they've got it vented special so it doesn't smell like a corpse. <laughs> so you don't have to be sketched out about it. You can go and enjoy. Cool. It is very cool. And it's beautiful. It's the most beautiful shade of burgundy, just rich. <laughs> okay, now let's see. Where am I here? All right. This was um, the uh, Legends of Conservation con contacted me and asked me to write an article for this publication that they were putting out called An Army of Conservationists. And so what they did is they reached out to different people who across the country who had a particular affinity towards a nature educator. And mine was surprise, Anna Comstock. <laughs> and so, and like, and other people did Teddy Roosevelt and they did John Muir and um, Thoreau and stuff. And so then what they did is they asked them, and I have a... Yeah, you know, you won't be able to see too much. But um, I, have, I do have a copy of it here. And you can see it's what, so what they did is we were to write a page about this particular, thank you, Don, <laughs> this particular person. And then what they did that was really cool is they created life size um, cutouts of that person. I told them to make Anna about five foot four. And then what they were doing is they would put all of these cutouts of all the people in the book. I think there's like 12 of them. And they would, they were the idea, this is of course pre-pandemic, put them as a group around in an airport or someplace like that where there'd be a lot of people come, you know, traffic going through, put traffic with a plaque of what we wrote at by this, you know, the idea to bring, so this is another nature study initiative, this is, but it's um, through conservation. So, and that's kind of where nature study language has gotten to today, that it pulls us in. It is, it is in conservation, it is in sustainability, um, it, you know, upcycle, recycle, those have all taken different meanings now. And that's how they're pulling, we're getting pulled into nature in different ways. Um, okay. And this is, <clears throat> this, I think this pretty much says it all. What I was trying to do and put these pictures and also is to show that just pulling nature into different ways in your life. The, these photographs are actually of my family. These are some, some of my grandsons and my parents uh, and apple trees. And, and we are a very outdoorsy family. And this is what Anna Comstock wanted. The far picture there on the right is one of my grandson inspecting his daffodils in his bathrobe. I love that picture. <laughs> but this is what she wanted. She wanted us not only to influence it's not to because some people were like they're trying to influence children through outdoor exploration a big per, uh, major person and that was liberty hyde bailey liberty hyde bailey wanted to originally teach children about nature nature study because he wanted to keep them on farms um and you know they at that time there was a, a depression that people were and they were traveling towards the cities looking for jobs and they were leaving the farm Bailey wanted to keep the people on the farm. And he thought that if the kids learned about nature, they would find it interesting. They would want to stay. They would take ownership of it. They would want to stay on the farm. Not so much, but, you know, we can all, you know, give them an attaboy for it. Whereas Anna, she kind of took, and this is also why Anna, why she pulls us, still pulls us into nature because um, she, she develops that curiosity. Her questions and her leaflets and, and the way she, she talks to us through her writing, it helps to develop our curiosity. All right, in this article I wrote, this was for the Bioheritage Diversity Library. This was in conjunction with the Smithsonian. And this was, they wanted to put some, you can see, find this online. Um, you can, and they wanted something about the conservationism of Anna Comstock. And basic, and what I, what I wanted to get across in my article here is that she shared this in um, an inspiring collective belief the, of her time. And these are of, of the people of, of her contemporaries that it was crucial that our imprint on as humans 
on the on the wild and natural landscapes be understood. That would that we we can respect them because and we can be uh, and we are a part of them, a, a part of this. Uh, this article came out. I think I mentioned is is part of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. I want to point out to everybody in whether on the computer or not, <laughs> the lower uh, right picture there, the leaves, that's poison ivy. I'm doing some nature educating here. <laughs> I got very badly um, infected or whatever by poison ivy this past summer. It was horrible. I had no idea what it looked like. I thought I did. You would think I would know. I didn't. It was terrible. It was a horrible three weeks of my life and I'm showing everybody that's what poison ivy looks like. <laughs> Okay. Now, <clears throat> this, these, again, this is photographs of some of my grandsons. This is my daughter. And she's looking, we're at the butterfly house. Right here is what I want to, this is how Mrs. Comstock, as I was saying, still draws us in. She is instilling the love and appreciation of this natural world. And, um, it's an, and it's the natural world around us. But also not only that it was around us, but for us to know that we are a crucial part of nature as participants. We are not just witness to everything that's going on, but we are actual participants. And that Comstock's approach that you know, nature is full of surprises um, that appeals, that approach appeals not only to children directly, but that also applies to us. I mean, we are at heart, we are still the children, you know, of years gone by, but we are still, that still is within us. That doesn't just go away. And that is what I think why that still, um, that, that is why Anna appeals to us. And in this, this article, I wanted to bring this article to your attention in case you are a Cornell alumni. And if you're not, I think you can find this online. This article I um, talks about, I just wanted to touch on it briefly. It gives an overall view about the Comstocks of Cornell. It talks about my book and what the research that I did. And I just wanted to bring it up and mention it because, um, you know, sometimes you can't you not necessarily run out and, and get the book, but you can get access to the article online and, and kind of uh, just learn a little bit more in, in your investigation. And um, yeah, and then I just, I think it had a, a lovely quote from Anna that um, where she says, nature study cultivates in the child a love of the beautiful. And that was really important to her. Now, Ithaca. So here we are sitting here in Ithaca, New York. What's around here? This might look familiar. This is part of the legacy of nature study here in Ithaca, New York that you can, ex you can explore yourself. This is actually, um, for those who um, are familiar with it or even not, this is Liberty Hyde Bailey's summer home. This is called Baileywood. And these I visited there with a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, and with the ranger, we went stomping through Baileywick um, inside and um, uh, we even sat on the roof. That far pic the picture there on the far right is sit from sitting on the roof of Baileywick and I took that picture. And so this is, this is where he came and, and in the summertime to get away from everything and did a lot of his writing. One of the things that Bailey did in the center photo is he grafted a pear tree to an apple tree. And that tree is still there, which is, I think, pretty cool. You can see where the graft is in the center. And then that pear, that photograph of the pear in the upper left corner is, is a pear fr uh, fruit from that tree. So Baileywick is here in Ithaca. What else is here? Well, the Comstock homes. Right here in this photograph, we have Going towards the left, this is the Comstock's private home up in Ithaca. And um, I was invited by the family who lives there now to come in and take a tour of the home. And I can tell you that was just over the moon for me. Um, 
that was a beautiful staircase looking down and it just it's it's not like it's anything like whoa spectacular but it it's just kind of makes her more tangible and this orange colored room bedroom that was her bedroom when you read in the book in Comstock's of Cornell she's talking about sleeping on her bedroom porch that's where she was sleeping was out in there the middle photos are and the photos to the more towards the um well I guess depends how you see stand on this is my right but that is the hermitage that is on uh Deganic lake and the family invited me the, the it, that is the john rice family they bought the property from glenn herrick who was the editor of the 1953 edition and that the family invited me to come out and give a presentation to their family about that the home and the history of their home and when you read the Comstocks of Cornell that they were out of the Hermitage, they were replacing the front window, the lead glass front window they were talking about in that farther right picture over there, there that's the window they were talking about that they replaced, that's original. Um, the Comstocks at their kitchen below, they did not bring the microwave, that came afterwards. <laughs> and then there's the porch. And this book in the center is actually wrote and she, and Anna Comstock um, autographed it and signed it to Mrs. Rice. And so that was on the shelf. They didn't even know it was there. I pulled it down and almost fell over. <laughs> uh, the very bottom photographs, the two small, small photos there, that was their first home, Fall Creek. And it's, I know it's difficult to see here, but the Fall Creek, it's the image here on um, my left. I guess that would be your left too as well. <laughs> and so that's this home right here. And then this picture here of the newspaper next to it is, is a, from the scrapbook that Anna's mother kept and it showed a picture of the house. So these homes, this, so this is also in the Ithaca area. And I know that uh, the one home, as I said, the gray house, that's a private residence, but the other one they do, um, I think they do like bed and breakfast type thingies there. So you can you know, like stay in a piece of history. Well, here it is, <laughs> the, the, camp, the camp, the Girl Scout camp. Every time I give a talk, I have somebody from the audience come up and say, tell me about that Girl Scout camp. I can tell you, I got not, there's not much to tell you about the Girl Scout camp. <laughs> Anna Liberty Hyde Bailey gave the land from Bailiwick because it was connected. For the, he donated for the Girl Scout camp. There's a letter between him and Mrs. Comstock where she is greatly appreciative for it, that he donated the land. And so then they built the um, lodge there. They built the fireplace and the fireplace, it says uh, this in this stone above the fireplace, it's, I can't make it all up. But it says this fireplace erected in honor of Anna Botsford Comstock, and it's by there's a word there. It looks like iota. I don't know what it is, but it's of the Kappa Alpha Theta, 1927. And then the lovely quote: "Nature and time and I are one." Um, they say the um, um, the ranger there said to me that he. There's not any been any proof, but they say that she wrote, apparently she lit the first fire in the fireplace. And that was it. Anna Comstock, she did not teach there. There's nothing that I have found in any of my literature, any of my research, any of my findings that she taught there. She, um, this was in 1927. She was very ill. Her husband was already infirmed and with strokes and bedridden she probably uh she kept close to ithaca she did not travel really anymore and so it um and just from what i know of her personally from through research i don't believe she would have made that was a, back in the day that was a long trip from ithaca up here to towards you know to Gannick to teach and she would not have done that with um her husband being so sick but yes. This is the property right across the street. Right across the street. Yep. This is that property. But, and so, and also one of the things that I learned that I didn't know, there's a little song that they sang. This is not the campfire song. This is another song that they sang. I have the campfire song 
is in the cover front cover of my book. But then there's there and there was another song that they sung. But what's interesting is she developed a pin, which is that little blurb that kind of looks like a flying worm, but it's supposed to be like a butterfly on a willow leaf or something. But it was created to be a pin so that it, when the girls would go through and they would do whatever nature study, I guess, lesson or something, then they would get the pin. And sometimes you see them on eBay. You know, I've, I was surprised. You know, I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah. Oh, there's somebody here who's saying that IOTA is the Cornell chapter of Kappa yeah. Alpha Theta sorority. Okay, yeah, so that was the word IOTA. I thought yeah. I was seeing things and I did not. It was either the, the IOTA chapter or the IOTA. Yep, that's what it, yep, that's what someone is saying. And, um, but there is very, this is pretty much well, the extent. Yeah, and somebody actually said in the, uh, yeah. in the chat that Iowa is the Cornell chapter. Is the Cornell, yeah, that's when I, yeah, I was reading that too. Yeah. And Anna was on the National Pro chapter. Right, yeah, but she did not, she did not do much more than this. Um, so, Anyway, but I, I just wanted to bring this. I thought you enjoy it. Mm -hmm. To no to the Girl Scouts for this for nature study education, and she just she was she just was thrilled with that that he would be donating that towards you know their you know towards the scouts. She yeah, was just thrilled. Another comment in the chat is that the Queen family donated most of the property to Queen Transpec. It's in the view that it will always be used in the Yeah. Well, I yeah, I'm not I'm not familiar with the Payne family, um, but there we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's very the, the it's there's a lot of fingers in the pudding. You know, the, it's it's very um, it's a very interesting story. Okay, so now moving on, we're going to talk about the Unitarian Church. Um, this is the windows in the Unitarian Church. Anna became, this is the book, the registry book. She became a member June 11th, 1911 at the church. Her husband did not, and which is, you know, that's fine. <laughs> so she became, and there's a picture of the church. And those windows there are showing Anna as like a Greek scholar. And she is with a scroll and she's educating the children. And they're, com and they're coming towards her. Uh, this window was donated by George Russell and his wife, Alma. They were like his, um, it's, yeah, yeah, there's someone here saying that many people think it's Jesus, but it's not, no, not at all, not at all. <laughs> this is Anna Comstock, and there's no plaque or saying, because George Russell and his wife, they did not want, he was like her adopted son. He, he was very close with the Comstock. He was like, he was with them for many years until they both passed and they wanted to do something for him or for her, but they wanted to do it anonymously. They want, because they didn't want the focus to be on them and their name on the plaque, like, oh, they gave this. He was a lawyer. He did become a lawyer in Ithaca area. He wanted the focus to be on Anna. And she was, as I said, she was a member of this church. So they had the window put in. And what's interesting about this picture, if you look at the picture and photograph, you can see here this, by the cars, it's probably like around the 1950s. Um, and then maybe a little bit, I'm not very good at dating cars, but maybe that's, that was my guess, late 50s, I guess. But you can see the already the windows were in place. There, but, and if you drive past and you can see those, but when you go into the church, that's where the magic happens. So they're, and they're very pretty. Now, of course, being with Ithaca, where else can you find this nature study? I had to say, you have to, in a cemetery. A cemetery is a great place for historical research. And it also, it, 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 to me, it really brings, it really means like these people, they were here. You know, this is, this, they were real, they were here. This is what we have left to them in memorial. And up here is um, where my face is. That's the day I found, after two years of searching, I found Anna Comstock and John Henry <laughs> thrilled to pieces. Um, so there's the Comstocks uh, over as you continue across the top row. That's George Byrne, a good friend of the Comstocks. He did not want Glenn Herrick, 
who was the editor of the 1953 book, he did not want Herrick to change anything in the manuscript. And of course, Herrick completely waited till Burr was dead and others that were dead to do what he wanted. Herrick's grave is below. In, uh, they are, these people are all in the same plot area. They are all buried together, which is really kind of neat. And in life, as they were in life, so they are in death. Um, now, uh, I have the middle picture is a frame. Is, this is actually Louis Agassiz Fuertes. No relation to our Agassiz earlier in the program, but his parents so admired him that they named their son after him. But our, our Fuertes, Agassiz Fuertes, he was an ornithologist and illustrator. And, um, and his grave is, is also up there at near in at Lake Cemetery near Comstock and the others. This big mausoleum, this is Liberty, the Liberty High Bailey. That's up there. We'll take a look at Liberty High Bailey and his family. Um, also, there's Carl Sagan. If you come up to Carl Sagan, you've gone too far, you should turn around and go back down the hill to where Anna Comstock is. And Carl Sagan, you know, is faith famous and strong. Uh, and then the far, uh, the far corner there is the Cornell Mausoleum or Ezra Cornell. The last one here is Al Alexis Babin and Alexis Babin, just on the side, he was a Russian scholar and he was a librarian at the Library of Congress. Uh, pretty much for the length of his career, he escaped. He, he accidentally shot his best friend and his best friend's parents were coming after him. And so he had to, he fled Russia and he came to the United States and he actually got into, after working, he then got into school at Cornell and became part of a tight group of young men who went and had Sunday dinner at the Cornell with the Comstocks regularly. And he became a part of the family. And so when Alexis died, um, it says when you, if you go online and look him up, you'll see they'll say like, oh, his, he died in Washington, DC. Well, what's interesting about Alexis' story is that yes, he died in Washington, DC, but he's buried here in Ithaca, New York because George Burr up there, you know, the top, the top right, went and got his ashes from Washington, DC and brought him back and asked Mrs. Comstock, can we put Alexis in the, here with us? And she said, yes. He considered his, uh, Ithaca as much as his home as anywhere else, and we, we can be, he can be with us. So that's why you, there's a small little uh, stone to Alexis Babin, and which I think is kind of neat. <clears throat> now this next slide. So this terrible map is the best map I could find of the area to encompass all these points. This is what I wanted to show you about um, just kind of, uh, again, about the nature study history in our area. All these places I just described to you, this is where they all are. This is how close this all is. So this is a, this area is really rich, not only in, um, in nature, nature study history, but also for the people who were here that are still here and that you can kind of go and, and research on your own and you can go see these places and, and kind of when you do, if you do some, uh, read about Anna Comstock and it, you know, you can go and visit her at Lakeview Cemetery. I don't know, I just think it brings everything kind of full circle. It's real, I find things like this interesting and I just wanted to pass that along, uh, you know, to you folks. Now, this is, well, I'm coming now to the close and what I wanted to show with this symbol, uh, this slide, again, this is my family. These are my daughters. Uh, our daughters and our grandsons and my husband in different parts of the country from Ithaca to Montana to Gigantic Falls. And we are very much now for a family. And this is what I guess the message more than anything that I wanted to leave with you in regards to Anna and why she, how she you know, continues to draw us into nature is that she wanted to develop um, a child's curiosity by opening um, one's eyes to their natural surroundings. And that's, that's what she did for us. That's what she wanted us to do with our own families and with our own children, is that she wanted us to begin with direct observation and to keep our experiences simple and to keep our experiences personal and to keep experiencing them over and over. And that is why she, I, 
she still speaks to us with nature study education. So on that, I have um, nothing more to add other than thank you very much. And this is just these last photos are of me. That was the day that I peed in the very last page of the manuscript. That is my favorite picture of Anna Comstock. And these were the other fun covers that they proposed for Comstocks of Cornell and the one that won <laughs> over. So, and um, that's me for Halloween. I'm always a butterfly. <laughs> Uh, if anybody have any questions about anything, um, yeah. Okay, the question is, what, um, what, what do I think um, made the Comstocks, I spoke earlier about the uh, Comstocks being pillars at Cornell University, and what do I think was different about them that ma made them pillars of that, of the university, because they had buildings named after them, and what made them special compared to, say, other people? I think part of the reason that they were pillars is because they were really there from the beginning. You know, they, this, the school opened in 65, 1868, around there. And John Comstock, he came to the school when he, in 1870. So right, you know, the school was like just baby brand new. And they had a work study program he built um, I think it was McGraw. He was part of moving the stone that built the school that built. And so he started like as a fledgling skinny kid and he worked himself up into and educating himself and then being into a professor and having an invest, invested interest in, um, in, in, in education, really. He was a self-made man he came, he literally came from nothing. He was treated like crap as a boy and he pulled himself up into something, you know, of erudition and um, an honor almost. And, and that, that was huge at that time, especially because he was, he was really, a, a man's man. He was really a self-made man. So I think being there from the beginning was part of it. Anna Comstock was in the first group of young women who occupied Sage Hall. She was one of the first 30 and she was right there in the beginning.